Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Before we start, um, just a few housekeeping announcements. Let's make sure that everyone's mic is muted throughout the presentation, please. And if you have any questions, feel free to send them into the chat. We will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. Also, just a reminder that this presentation is recorded. So for anyone who is new to the Nigerian Center, we are a nonprofit organization that focuses on uplifting and giving resources to the Nigerian diaspora in the US. We aim to accomplish this in a variety of ways. We offer immigration legal services, home ownership services, entrepreneurship and small business resources, as well as language classes. We also host cultural events centered around Nigerian culture. While we are called a Nigerian center, our principal goal is to help uplift all immigrant communities here in the U.S. Now, moving towards today's event, today's speaker who has courteously volunteered her time is Ms. Daniela Garcia, who is an attorney and immigration law expert. Today's topic is humanitarian-based work authorizations. But before we hear from Ms. Garcia, we will have a brief word from our CEO and founder, Mr. Benga Ogunjimi. Benga, the podium is all yours. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tyler. And thank you, everyone, once again for coming out virtually today to be a part of this immigration rights workshop. Um, so before we get started, I wanted to talk about a little bit about the Nigerian Center. And I want to talk about our upcoming events and opportunities to get involved in, water work, in the work that we do. The Nigerian Center is the very first Nigerian American immigrant and community center located in Washington, DC, but we are serving the community across the country. Uh, our mission is to foster financial inclusion and to provide connection to, America, to the Nigerian culture here in America. While we are called the Nigerian Center, our program is not exclusive to Nigerians in America. It is open to all immigrant groups. And uh, to carry out this mission, we have identified four areas of asset building. Uh, the very first of which is immigration. Um, we know that immigration is critical uh, for your American journey and uh, to accomplish an American dream. When we talk about financial inclusion, we cannot begin to start the process without the right legal um, status. So that because of that, we have decided to prioritize our resources towards immigration rights opportunities. And we're doing so with our monthly workshops and a network of law firms across the country providing low bono and sometimes pro bono services to our members. Um, our next program that we've identified in the area of asset building is home ownership. We know home ownership around the world, particularly in America, are the cornerstones for uh, wealth building for financial inclusion. And oftentimes due to barriers such as legal status, uh, lack of understanding about the mortgage system in America, a lot of immigrants spend unnecessary time renting when they have the resources to own their own homes. Uh, the third service, an area of asset building is uh, access to capital. Entrepreneurship we know is not an aspiration, it's not a luxury uh, for a lot of immigrants. It's a survival strategy. Because of that, we are providing access to startup capital and financial uh, education classes for our, for our community. And that is why we have the Nigerian Center. Um, in addition to access to capital, we also have uh, language classes. Uh, so we started to organize language classes in Aosa, Igbo, and Yoruba uh, that folks can be a part of across the country. Um, so those are the programs that we have at the Nigerian Center. Uh, our next event is going to happen next week, Wednesday, and it's going to be access to capital. We are going to be releasing and announcing our micro loan programs. And part of this includes zero interest program for women entrepreneurs, um, as well as uh, zero interest and single digit interest for credit building. Oftentimes when folks come into America, it takes a while to get accustomed to the credit system. And because of that, they spend a lot of time without having credit history. For those who are regarded as credit invincible, we will not be able to provide them access to capital. For, so for those in your community, they can now start to build credit from day one in America. 
Um, this class, we are going to have a guest speaker, uh, Mr. Douglas Aze, uh, would be talking about his wealth journey. His, he, he, he runs the Lago Financial Services Company here in DC, and he'll be sharing financial strategies and tips towards wealth building. Um, so it's going to be between one. There'll be access to uh, capital, and also there'll be financial education. Uh, so please, and do you want to be a part of that program? Um, the recording of all our immigration rights workshops, including this particular episode, uh, will be available and is currently available on our media page. Um, our last event was about employment-based immigration. If you missed it, we covered the entire spectrum of EB1 to 5 categories of immigration. Um, and we also talk about some strategies that may not be widely known that you should take advantage of. So all the recording, including our previous home ownership workshops, um, you can find this recording on our on-demand page, our media page. That is the link to access that particular, uh, those workshops uh, recording. Um, we are asking for volunteers. Currently, Nigerian Center is an exclusive volunteer-led, volunteer-run organizations. Um, and we ask for expertise to be a part of what we do. So please go to nigeriancenter.org for slash serve to see opportunities to get involved, or you can just reach out to us and email us and see how you can be a part of our program. We just launched our community partners program. Our community partners program, our highs and ears and feet and hands in the community. Um, and they give us access to communities we'll not be able to connect to. Uh, and we really want you to tell us what are the pain points of the constituencies you serve. This includes members of the faith-based community, uh, for-profit, non-profit community, uh, from the media community. Um, so whatever community you serve, that you are like the conduit to accessing Nigerian Americans, African uh, uh, diaspora, um, even immigrant groups, we want you to be on our community partners program. And it's a periodic meetings where we are announcing our priorities and you are letting us know what the pain points of your communities are so we can incorporate those in our programming. So think about this as an advisory board um, of the Nigerian Center. We are opening this up to every single one. Um, if you currently do not follow us on social media, we ask that you please do so on Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Twitter. Um, hopefully we get on TikTok very soon. We're not there yet. So, <laughs> and it's the, it's the way everyone must be at. Um, I should highlight that on Twitter, it is just Nigerian Center. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is Nigerian Center, no uh, the T-H-E. But on Facebook and Instagram, it is the Nigerian Center. Um, we need your donations. Please consider us for donations. If you want to donate to a nonprofit, we are a 501c3 tax exempt. Uh, beyond your individual donations, uh, if the organizations as well, we should be connected to, uh, please put us in contact with them. Uh, we also ask that you consider becoming a recurring donor uh, to support the work that we do so we can keep supporting and uplifting the community your financial resources is going to go a long way, tremendously. That said, um, I want to have the opportunity to um, turn the microphone over to Ms. Daniela Garcia um, of the DC Volunteer Lawyers Project. Um, they've been a partner to us and they're, already pro they're currently providing services to our client and we cannot be more thrilled and honored for the opportunity to present this workshop. Over to you, Ms. Daniela. Thank you. Thanks for that wonderful introduction for um, also helping me learn a little bit more about the Nigerian Center. Um, if I could share my screen, um, do you mind if I do that? Perfect. Then we can get started. Okay. So you should be able to see uh, my slides. Does that, can you see them? Perfect. Okay. Um, so today, uh, uh, today I'm going to, um, well, first let me say thanks again and for the invitation. I appreciate it. Um, 
Uh, again, my name is Daniela Huerta Garcia, and I am the managing attorney for the immigration practice of the DC Volunteer Lawyers Project, a nonprofit based out of DC, which focuses on serving domestic violence survivors, children at risk, and other vulnerable communities. Today, I will be speaking about work permits as it relates to humanitarian forms of immigration relief. So let's look at our agenda for tonight. Uh, first, I will be giving a quick background on immigration law so that we can all understand what these humanitarian forms of relief are that I just mentioned and that I know is in the title for the presentation tonight. Second, I will talk about how to get work permits through these immigration applications. Third, I'm going to talk about um, applying for your work permit, waiting for your work permit, and then working once you have that work permit. Then we will touch on the 540 day automatic extension that is currently applicable to work permits. And finally, I will talk about clinic consultations. So let's start with understanding immigration law just a little bit more. So there are many kinds of ways to obtain legal immigration status in the US. Um, the first, which we're going to talk about today, is humanitarian forms of relief. Uh, the others are listed here in yellow. And I know that uh, Benga just uh, mentioned that you, you all had a presentation on employment-based. So that's a different category of immigration law, a different area of immigration law. And that's where, where your H-1Bs, your H-2Bs, that's where those live. Um, there's also family-based. Uh, this is where we see the most often, for example, a brother who's already a U.S. citizen sponsoring a sister that isn't, or someone with no status marrying a U.S. citizen and acquiring um, their papers <laughs> that way and then others. So other categories of visas that can be uh, visitors, students, O visa for those that are called um, special skill set, uh, P visa, which I believe are, those are for athletes. We don't, DCVLP doesn't really deal in this realm of the bottom boxes. We mostly focus on humanitarian uh, forms of relief for immigration. So that focus, uh, I'm gonna go through that specifically, and then we're going to get to work permits. So these humanitarian applications for relief are asylum for those who have faced persecution in their home country due to five specific grounds, U visas, which is for which are for victims of crimes, T visas, which are for trafficking victims, VAWA uh, self petitions uh, that stands for Violence Against Women Women's Act, but anyone who has been uh, who has suffered abuse at the hands of a legal permanent resident or a U.S. citizen spouse or child can apply. SIGS is Special Immigrant Juvenile Status, and that's, that, those visas are reserved for those who are under 18 years old who have been abused, neglected, or abandoned. TPS, or Temporary, temporary Protected Status, which are for nationals of certain countries that have been deemed dangerous to return to. And DACA, which is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, for those who were brought to the U.S. before they were 16 years old. So, as I mentioned, even though the focus of this presentation is work permits, the reason I'm speaking about these kinds of applications is because a work permit is linked to these applications. Work permits, at least in this realm of humanitarian law, cannot be acquired by themselves. And if anyone is telling you otherwise, that is a scam. Work permits are always attached to a larger application, uh, an underlying application. So here on the screen, uh, it's you, right? The little person, it's you. And then you apply for whatever that um, underlying application is. If it's asylum, if it's U visa, if it's a TPS, and then you get your work permit from there. So focusing on these forms of humanitarian immigration relief, let's talk about when individuals are able to get work permits since the timelines vary depending on what your underlying um, application is. For example, work permits through asylum work in the following way. Uh, for your initial work permit, you can submit um, for this initial work permit 150 days after submission of an application for asylum. This initial request are supposed to take only 30 days to adjudicate. They're taking a little bit longer, probably closer to three months, uh, and there is no cost to do this application. For your renewals, you need to mail those in 180 days before the expiration date on your card. And the length of time to adjudicate a work permit renewal for asylum seekers right now is being it's being closer to probably four or five months. Uh, this can be your work permit can be renewed indefinitely until your asylum application is decided. And the cost is $410 for every two years. Um, there are some options 
grounds for waiving some of these fees that I'm going to talk about. Uh, but it, some of the waivers have their own issues. Uh, they get rejected very often and you can only qualify due to certain categories and certain requirements. So let's talk about work permits through U visas. Uh, the work permits through the U visas take significantly longer. Uh, you must wait for your U visa approval or to be placed on a wait list or for what we call a bona fide determination in order to get your work permit. So whereas the timeline for asylum seekers is that you can file for your work permit after 150 days after you have submitted your asylum application, you must wait for this uh, to be placed either in the approval, waitlist, or bona fide determination lines uh, in order to get your work permit through a U visa. And as you can see from the screen, that being placed in any of those three categories is taking anywhere from five to six years at the moment. Um, like asylum, your work permit can be renewed indefinitely until your U visa is adjudicated, so until it's approved or it's denied. And then the cost, this one does have an initial cost of $410, and then the renewals every two years are also $410. Work permits through T visas are similar to the U visas in that um, the work permits don't come until after the underlying application is completely approved. And that approval can take two years, so the timeline is a little bit less than the U visas. Um, and this work permit is for four years. It's a little bit longer than for the asylum and for the U visas. There is no cost for the initial, and I didn't put anything here for the renewal because um, usually the T visa process takes a little bit longer. Uh, there's not that many people that actually fall under this category, so the process takes a little bit. It's a little bit shorter. Um, so, uh, let's talk about work permits through VAWA. So this one also similar to the U visas and the T visas, uh, one must wait for approval of the self petition uh, before getting the work permit. And the current time is around two and a half years to probably three or four years. It's a range, right, um, for the approval. And again, this can be renewed indefinitely until legal permanent residency is granted. Uh, the cost is more similar to the um, asylum work permits, which is uh, there's no cost for the initials and 410 for renewals every two years. Now work permits through SIJS, which is the, the one at the visa applicable for those under 18, is a new development that will be incurred in May of this year. Um, you must still wait for your SIJS um, application approval. But before it used to be that you had to get all the way until getting your legal permit and residency to get the work permit. So now while the uh, SIJS application approval takes anywhere from 10 to 14 months, people are no longer waiting those two, three, four or five years in order to be able to get their work permit. And although, like as I mentioned, is for those under 18, somebody who's 17 today could apply for this and they would still be waiting four or five years later. So at that point, there would be in the early 20s and they would still not be able to work. So this is a significant development for us in the last couple of months. Um, the cost, again, uh, you're seeing a trend here, uh, none for the initial and 410 for renewal. And as I mentioned at the beginning, there are some waivers that may be able to, to be applied so that the fee doesn't have to be paid, but those um, are sometimes a little difficult to get. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this at the beginning, but you can see it on the screen. There are only certain countries that are designated for TPS at the moment, and I have listed on the screen the ones that have been designated for TPS and the ones that currently have open registrations. For more updated information, um, it's important for you to visit the USCIS website. There are registration periods. Sometimes the registration periods are different if you're re-registering for TPS or if it is your first time registering for TPS. Um, and then uh, they have other requirements such as how long the, the individual applying has been present in the United States and whether they are able to qualify for, for this um, temporary protected status. Uh, the cost, uh, this one is a little bit heftier because not only are you applying for the work permit, but you're also uh, paying for your application. All of the other um, underlying applications that I just mentioned, the U visa, the T visa, SIJS, none of those applications themselves have any fees. What you're paying for is the work permit. But for TPS, and we, as we will see in the next slide in DACA, uh, you're paying for registering to have that status on top of paying for the work permit. So these, these fees, as you can see on the screen, get a little bit heftier for both the initial work permit and for the renewal. And so let's finally talk about uh, work permits through DACA. Uh, so first, first and foremost, 
uh, USCIS is not currently adjudicating new applications, only renewals. So if you currently have DACA and you haven't had a gap of more than a year in your renewal process, you can continue um, uh, renewing your work permit and your DACA status. If there has been more than a year gap, uh, you might get rejected. And if you've never applied or you're an initial applicant, you can send in your application, but they're not being decided right now. There's an injunction that is preventing those new applications from being um, reviewed and decided. Uh, the cost, is, if you are able to renew, is $495 every two years. Again, that's a little bit more expensive because with as with TPS, you're not only paying for the work permit, you're also paying to um, keep your status as, uh, as a DACA recipient. So next, I'm going to talk about um, applying, waiting, and working um, as it relates to the EAD. Uh, so what documents do you need to apply for a work permit? Uh, first, you need your underlying application, right? What are you applying for that then makes you qualify for the work permit? Uh, then you fill out a form, uh, I-765, that is the work permit application. It's very easy, it's about three or four pages, um, and it's pretty, like you should be able to do it yourself, basically. Um, depending on how you qualify for your work permit, meaning your underlying application, uh, you may also require to fill out an I-765W. That's a worksheet where you tell the government uh, basically why you need to work, what your expenses are, and why you need the why you need to be able to work, why you need the income. Uh, you also need your passport, a photo, a, a photocopy of your passport and or an ID. Your ID can be a license that you have right now, a work permit that you have now, like your a, a, an old work permit if this is a renewal, or it can be an ID from your home country if this is your initial application. An I-94, these you usually get if you come in um, with a visa into the United States. If you came in without inspection, you don't have an I-94, but if you have one, they're very easy to download from uh, the i94.gov website, uh, even if it's expired. You also need to uh, turn in two passport size photographs um, with your A number written in the back in pencil, and then a receipt or approval notice of the underlying application. So that's your packet that needs to go in when you file your uh, 765. So what can you do while your work permit application is being processed? First of all, be patient. <laughs> I know that these timelines are very long and they're very big. And uh, the thing, this is the question that I get asked the most, when am I going to be able to start working in the United States? Uh, I understand, I'm very sorry. Um, it's, it is taking a very long time. There is a huge backlog in immigration applications, anything from um, to get your green card all the way to get your work permit, there's a huge backlog. And so I just please need you to be patient. Uh, number two, you're able to volunteer your time while you are waiting for your work permit to come in. And there are a couple of rules around volunteering, but um, you should be able to, to still do that with no problem. So you can, the, the rules for, for volunteering is that you're not being paid uh, and that the position that you're volunteering for isn't usually paid. So what I mean by that is that um, if you would be working without pay in a job that would otherwise be paid, this can be considered unauthorized work uh, that you're just that the only reason you're not getting paid is because you don't have your work permit, essentially. And so that that would be counted against you, that you're working unauthorized. So even if you're not getting paid, you should not be doing that job. A good rule of thumb to follow is that you shouldn't do any volunteer work that is directly related to your professional training, to whatever career you had, maybe in your home country or that you're trying to build here. So for example, I'm an attorney, right? And uh, giving any sort of, and if I didn't have any work authorization, I wouldn't be able to to give even this sort of presentations in my spare time. I wouldn't be able to give legal advice or do any kind of consults because that is in my professional expertise, right? That is part of being an attorney. So I wouldn't be able to do any of that even as volunteer work, even as, as something that I'm not being paid because it, it, I, it would be being paid if I were, it were authorized to work. So finally, once you get your work permit, you have it in your hand, you have received it, what jobs can you do with your work permit? Essentially anything. You're allowed to take any case that you, that you 
uh, are qualified for in the United States. Uh, probably an exception is that you can't work for the federal government. Sometimes they flip flop back and forth if you are interested in doing that, working for a congressman or a, a, a US senator, um, being on their staff. Um, Back before uh, 2016, uh, they didn't care so much. And even if you were in, if you were on a work permit, they would let you work there. <laughs> During the 2016 to 2020 years, they were a little more stringent. And now I'm not really sure uh, where they are <laughs> on letting people work if they have a work permit. But essentially, anything else, you should be good to go. It shouldn't be a problem. So now let's talk about um, you when your work permit expires. So normally your work permit expires on the date that is on the card. So when you send that packet in that we talked about earlier, within if you're an initial, if you're an asylum seeker, it's going to take, uh, if you're an initial applicant, it's going to take about, right now it's taking about three months, or if you're a renewal, it's taking about five months, or if you're in, in any of those other categories that I mentioned, around that time, probably six to seven months, um, you get it, you get a physical card. And it has your name, it has your A number, it has the category that you applied under, and then it has um, the date it was issued and the date of your expiration date. Usually that is the date of your expiration date and 180 days before that expiration date on your card, you need to send in your renewal. However, there have been crazy backlogs at USCIS since April of this year, which I mentioned previously. And as such, as of May 4th of this year, work permits are being given an, given an automatic extension of 540 days past the expiration date written on your card. So this means that your card, your EAD, expires about 17 months after what is written on your card. Uh, that's one seven, 17 months. Due to this extension, you will not get a new card from USAS reflecting this new date. You will get to keep your old one. You will not get a new I-797 from USAS reflecting this date. So the I-797, usually when you get your card, you also get a letter from USAS. At the top, it says I-797, and it's a notice that you've been approved for your work permit. Uh, you're not going to get a new one that says this work permit uh, has an extension of 540 days. You don't get a new one. You get to stick with your old one, uh, the original that came with your work permit. Um, but you will be able to continue working without a problem during those 540 days ex automatic extension. Uh, again, since this is uh, something that came down from USCIS, your employer should not give you any problems in continuing to work despite what it says on your card. But if they do, um, I recommend that you print out this website or email them this website to let them know about this automatic 540 day extension. It lays out uh, when the extension was um, handed down, like when it was published by USCIS, who it applies to, how many days. It explains also these bullets that I have here about um, the fact that you're not gonna get a new card or a new 797. Um, so it should answer a lot of the questions. So now that um, I had, I know that I have some folks here on different kinds of immigration status. So I want to be clear that this um, 540 day extension doesn't apply to everyone. It only applies to those who have been granted withholding of removal or withholding of deprecation, those who have been granted TPS status, those who are still uh, seeking asylum, and those who are in the middle of getting their green card and the application of getting their green card. And within that category of folks, this extension applies to those who filed their EAD renewal before May 4, 2022, and the 180-day extension has already expired. To those who applied for the renewal before May 4, 2022, and the 180-day um, automatic extension has not expired. And for those who filed for the renewal anytime between May 4th of this year and October 26th of 2023. Those, that's the, the timeline that USCIS is giving for how long they're extending this 540-day uh, extension. That date can always change, can always um, be extended. So instead of October, they might make it November or December. For, they're not going to shorten it. So this uh, May 4th through October 26th of next year, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, is um, written in stone, so to say, but they may be able, they may extend those dates depending on how they're seeing that their backlog issue is going. So after providing you this information, I also want to provide you with a resource in case you do need or want to speak with an attorney. 
Uh, please remember that our expertise only lies in the kinds of applications that I mentioned today, the humanitarian forms of, uh, of relief. So we wouldn't be able to really help you with anything outside of those questions. We don't have the expertise and we wouldn't feel comfortable giving you advice that we don't really trust ourselves. Um, one thing to note is that I will give you a resource, but you should go through uh, the Nigerian Center who then make referrals to us. Um, you give them your information and then they come to us and they refer you over and we can make a slot for you um, at our at our clinic. So on Wednesdays, we provide a free clinic based in the Southwest neighborhood of DC. We schedule our consultations. So if you're interested in an appointment, again, please uh, get in touch with the Nigerian Center and we can slot you in for a consultation for Wednesdays. At the consultation, we can speak about a specific question you have or we can be broader, speaking about the kinds of relief you may be eligible for if you don't already have a case or an understanding really of where you are immigration wise. So you can come in with very big questions or no questions at all, just you wanna have a conversation and see if something fits for your specific uh, life situation, or you can come in with a very specific question about this one form that you're, you're trying to fill out. Your, uh, your consultation can also be a time when we review an application that you have filled out yourself. If you don't have an attorney and you're filling out your own paperwork, but you want an attorney to take a look, you are able to bring in this kind of paperwork and these kind of questions to our clinic and we can take a look at you. So one thing to remember for these in-person uh, in person consultations, it's very easy to do the uh, these sort of consultations of looking at your paperwork, those are easy to do in person. We don't really offer those um, if these are like phone consultations. The phone consultations are more um, calling. Uh, talking. Is that which? Excuse me. Um, again, the clinic is completely free, as it says at the top of the slide, uh, but we do need you to schedule an appointment. So again, please go first through the Nigerian Center who can make a referral to us and we can schedule you in for an appointment. Uh, please note that um, we hold this uh, this clinic on Wednesdays and sometimes, for example, if you called um, yesterday, for example, maybe today wasn't we didn't have slots, but we'll try to get you in in the next available Wednesday so that we can speak with you ASAP. So um, with that, that's the conclusion of my presentation and now I'm happy to answer any questions you have if you want to put them in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself and thank you again all for your time. Hey, Daniela, I actually had um, a few questions, if you don't mm -hmm. mind answering. Sure. Um, so my first question was, um, in general, if I had a question about work authorizations, is there some type of online resource that's a catch-all that just has all the information I need? Well, what would be the best resource in general if I was seeking something like that? Um, a catch-all. Um, okay, so for asylum seekers in general, um, ASAP, which is the asylum, oh man, I can't remember what that stands for, but essentially if you type in ASAP Project Asylum Seeker into Google, it's the first organization that comes up and they have wonderful information about um, applying for a work permit, what you need, what to do if there's a delay, applying for your renewal, um, litigation, and what is currently going on, how much you have to pay. They have wonderful, super, super uh, detailed information about how you can do your own paperwork, basically, when it comes to uh, work authorization. Um, that is specific for asylum seekers. Um, for other in general information, the USCIS website, um, for I-765s, that should give you more information about how to fill out the form, instructions on the form. I think the instructions are available in different languages as well. Um, the application that needs to go into immigration needs to be in English, but you can look at the instructions in other languages as well. Okay, perfect, thank you. I had just one more question. So at the Nigerian Center, we, we've noticed a lot of members of our community who are, um, here under asylum that they they are in the process of you know fully achieving their asylum status but then they often get kind of radio silence um from the proper authorities for an extended period of time is this a common problem where people seeking asylum um you know just have difficulty with the process overall 
Yeah, um, a hundred percent. I wouldn't necessarily classify it as a as a problem or um, as something that should give you pause. Um, I do get that a lot. A lot of our clinic, uh, of the people that visit us at clinic, uh, often come because they they have this sort of radio silence and they wonder if that means anything bad or um, if it's going to affect their application. Uh, and that that radio silence comes from the backlogs that I mentioned. Um, USCIS doesn't have enough staff, and it's a continuing problem. But while they don't have enough staff more and more immigrants, right? Like keep submitting their applications. They keep arriving at the country. Like they're trying to achieve their own like American dream, right? Like nobody's stopping immigrants. Um, and so this is just, uh, if there was this much backlog, you know, then we're just kind of building on top of it. We just continue building on top of it. Uh, that radio silence, it, it doesn't mean anything. It just means that you're waiting. Um, I don't know if this is a, a, a well-known fact, but um, when people apply for asylum, uh, right now, their USCIS is doing like the fir first in, first out method. So um, let's say you apply today. We are seeing that um, if you don't get picked up within the first 45 days of applying for your uh, for asylum, you're sent to the back of the line. And there's no real rhyme or reason why you get picked up or don't get picked up in those first 45 days. But if you don't get picked up in those first 45 days, you're probably looking at being in the back of the line or in the backlog for anywhere from three to six years in to finish adjudicating your, your asylum case. Again, that weight doesn't mean anything. It just means that you know your lottery number wasn't picked in the first 45 days. Um, if there is a problem, they're going to send you what is called an RFE, a request for evidence. And that means that there was something missing from your application or um, they just want to, to have more information about something specific that was in your in your application. So it's important that people keep their address updated with USCIS or with the court if that's where they have their case. Perfect, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? All right, so if no one else have, has any questions, um, let me share my screen. I'll conclude the presentation. So. All right. Okay. So thank you everyone for coming. Um, we really do appreciate it. Um, in the hey, chat, hey, we Ty. will be sending you. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Tyler. I think maybe Carol has a question, but I think she's saying that she oh, can unmute my. herself. Okay. Yeah. See, um, so you can go and send the question to the, to the chat if you would like, Carol. Okay, so I think Carol's question is, what about those that are U.S. citizens that want to sponsor an individual from Nigeria through a visa? Um, I, 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 I think I would need a little bit more detail here about um, they may be trying to come over to obtain their master's. Okay, so that sounds like that person maybe needs to obtain a student visa, and those are um, F1s. Um, we don't deal with those kind of cases. I don't have a lot of expertise with those cases. Uh, my understanding is that they need to be enrolled in a program before they are given that visa, before they can start that, that, that process of getting the visa. Um, if this is somebody that is, well, I, I will stop there. I will uh, put in the chat the kind of, um, the kind of visa that um, you can look into for students.
Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? All right. So if you guys don't mind, um, could you go ahead and fill out this evaluation form? It would really help us in making sure that you enjoyed this presentation. Um, so once again, uh, I just want to thank everyone for attending. We really appreciate you coming out and listening to us. Thank you once again to Ms. Daniela Garcia. Um, and I just wanted to recap on some important info. So our upcoming workshop next Wednesday, um, please make sure to RSVP if you're interested in attending. Um, also, just a reminder that we want to let you know that you can always access our previous recordings on our website with this link. We also want to ask for volunteers. If you want to join, please feel free to contact us. We also um, uh, have a link early in the presentation that you can go to to volunteer. Additionally, we just started our community partner program. So if you're interested, please feel free to reach out to us. We'd really appreciate any type of partners, cultural, immigration, anything you can think of. And uh, we also ask you guys to follow us on social media. On Twitter, we're the, we're just the Nigerian Center. But on Instagram and Facebook, we're the Nigerian Center. So if you guys would like to follow us, we'd really appreciate it. And finally, we also appreciate any donations. You can visit the link early in the presentation if you would like to donate to us. Um, so with that, thank you guys, everyone for coming. We really do appreciate it. Um, and, and yeah, so thank you everyone. We hope you have a great day.